I'm going to start with the main office. The first thing to do is create a list of VLANs and subnets that we'll need to support our devices. Based on what we know, we are going to need to consider workstations, phones and servers. We know there are 5 servers, 125 workstations and 125 phones. Remember each user has a workstation and a phone. What about printers? There's got to be a few printers on the network. No one told us about that in the original design requirements, did they? In the real world, this is where we would go back to our customer and ask a few more questions about their needs. In our scenario, let's assume that the customer told us that there are five printers. Let's put these in the workstations network, bringing the host count to 130. We also don't have any information about Wi-Fi. This is another case where we should go back to the customer and ask more questions. For now, let's assume that they don't need Wi-Fi today. But they may want to add it in future. Planning for the future like this will often make things easier on us later. So let's assume that each staff member has a phone or tablet that connects to Wi-Fi. There may even be a few other Wi-Fi devices. So let's say there could be up to 150 wireless devices. Okay, now it's time to start assigning some subnets. The first thing I'm going to do is assign the 172.16.0.0/16 network to the whole of the main office. Now on the surface that might seem a little weird. After all, that's one big network. But there is a reason for this. We're going to divide this big network up into smaller subnets. That makes this big slash 16 network a summary network. What I'm trying to achieve is this. Any subnet in the main office starts with 17216. Why? Well, there are a few reasons I do this. One is to keep our subnets organized. This helps when we're troubleshooting issues. That includes looking at logs, pings, or trace routes. If we see an IP starting with 17216, then we immediately know it's in our main office. Another reason for this is because it keeps our routing tables nice and simple. And I'll explain that part a bit later on. We have four networks that we need to plan for here. I'm going to assign a slash 24 network to each of them. Notice that they're all part of the larger 172.16.0.0 slash 16 network. Why do you think slash 24 networks are a good choice here? Once again, there's a few reasons. First, they're very easy to work with. They're easy to read, as the first three parts are the network ID, and the final one is the host ID. There's no fancy binary conversions you have to do in your head or on a calculator here. Additionally, each slash 24 network allows for up to 254 hosts. This more than covers our host count for each network, while still leaving room to grow. Not to mention that there may be devices that our customer has forgotten to tell us about. Yes, it does seem overkill in the case of the server network, but that's not a problem in a case like this, where we have plenty of addresses to spare. Keeping it simple is more important here. You'll also notice that there's room left between each subnet. Of course, that's not a rule, you don't have to do that, but making each network a multiple of five simplifies things here. Remember that we're not the only people who will work on this network, so we're trying to make it simple for everyone. The other advantage of that is scalability. Scalability means leaving room to grow. If our customer were to grow much more than we expected, then we can expand these subnets to slash 23s if we had to. So why don't we break the network up into smaller subnets? Why not use one big subnet for the entire site? That is, with all the Wi-Fi devices, all the workstations, the phones, the servers, all in one big network. And well, there's a few reasons for this too. It improves management later, as we can easily identify devices based on their IP address. We can apply different settings to each subnet if we want to. This might include prioritizing voice traffic, which we're going to discuss in later videos. Voice traffic, that is phones, should be on a separate VLAN. As we know, we should have one subnet per VLAN. And we can apply security between the subnets if we want to. That is, we can have ACLs or firewalls to restrict traffic between these networks. These may not all be things that we want to do straight away, but if we plan well now, we're in a good position to add these features in the future. Now to choose some VLAN IDs. 
We can use nearly any IDs we want, but here I have selected 5, 10, 15, and 20. So why have I done this? Just simply so it matches the subnet. This once again is just a little simpler and easier for us. That is, it's easy to remember that VLAN 5 goes with subnet 5. Of course, that's not a rule. I just find that easy to work with. We can now start assigning IP addresses to the devices. In the main office, the core switch is the default gateway for each network. We can pick any IP in the subnet for this, but I always pick something that's easy to remember. I usually use the first or last usable IP address in the subnet. In this case, let's use the first, which is dot one. The really important thing here is to be consistent. That is, use dot one in each subnet as the default gateway. This way you will always know the default gateway without having to refer to any documentation. The layer two switches, they don't need any IP addresses configured. Each server should have an IP address too. It doesn't really matter too much what we give them, so let's use dot ten through to dot fourteen. We wouldn't configure static addresses for the workstations and phones though. That's far too much work. Instead, we'll want to use a DHCP server to assign IP addresses to these devices. For this, we know that one of our servers is a DHCP server. But if you think about how DHCP works, you'll remember that it uses broadcast messages. Can you see the problem that it might pose? As routers in layer 3 switches do not forward broadcast packets. So how then will DHCP requests from workstations and phones reach the server? After all, they're all on different subnets, aren't they? We achieve this by configuring the core switch as a DHCP helper. This is also known as DHCP relay. When a client sends a DHCP discover message, the core switch will see it, and then it will forward it on to the real DHCP server. The server then sends the switch its offer message and the switch forwards it back to the client. When we configure a DHCP helper, we don't need to have a DHCP server in each subnet. 